Brought to you by PrayLatin.com, makers of prayer cards featuring complete English phonetic renderings of Latin pronunciations. There are people who probably do not understand why approaching three weeks after the fact, much of the Catholic world is still talking about Francis' suppression of the Latin Mass, his arbitrary move to eventually end the Latin Mass altogether. The answer is simple. It's the biggest story of the year, at least in the Catholic world, if not the biggest story of the entire Francis pontificate. Because this move by Francis was a misuse of authority as Pope, something that even some of the secular world is noticing, as well as many Catholics who do not share convictions about the traditional sacraments, it's really worth coming to an understanding on, and it really does take time. Archbishop Vigano released a letter on this subject, which I featured yesterday on Spotify and Google Podcasts. That letter is too much for this place in its entirety, but at the heart of it is the concept of papal authority and power. Vigano isn't the only bishop to recently release statements describing Francis's actions as a misuse of his papal position, either. The very heart of this discussion is the Church right now is something that Archbishop Lefebvre said many years ago, when confronted with the accusation that he was being disobedient to the Pope. To that he would say, quote, The power of the Pope is supreme but not absolute and limitless, because it is subordinate to the divine authority expressed in tradition." End quote. But I'm not going to begin really with Vigano. A few days ago, Bishop Rob Mutzertz of Denmark released a letter to the faithful saying that Francis had made war against the faithful. Even the Catholic News Agency reported this story, and as of the time of this recording, Bishop Rob Mutzertz hadn't been censured by Rome, at least not yet, though that may certainly be coming. His argument is that Francis acted because it was clear that he was losing his authority, which is also why Francis took the tone that he did. Quote, Pope Francis promotes synodality. Everyone should be able to have their say. Everyone should be heard. There was a little question of this in his recently published modu proprio, Traditionis Custodis, a diktat that should be put an immediate end to the traditional Latin Mass. In so doing, Francis strikes some more on Pontificum, Pope Benedict's modu proprio, which gave ample space to the Old Mass." End quote. The hypocrisy Bishop Mutzertz points out here is obvious and has been pointed out numerous times before, but what hasn't really been commented on much in the continuing avalanche of material on this topic is that Francis's authority in the Church is withering, and it's not because of meanie-headed trads who just want the faith promoted and defended by the Church, but rather by the German bishops who continued to flaunt his words until he either gave in to their demands and embraced their program of virtual apostasy, or revealed that he had supported it the whole time. Quote, this was already evident earlier when the German bishops' conference took no notice of the Pope's advice regarding the synodality process. The same occurred in the United States when Pope Francis called on the bishops' conference not to prepare a document on receiving Holy Communion in a dignified way. The Pope must have thought it would be better not to give advice, but an injunction, now that we are talking about the traditional Mass." End quote. Bear all that in mind, because no Pope has the authority to abrogate the sacred traditions of the faith, or to deny even undefined dogmas of the faith the way that he did with the Marian concepts of Our Lady being Mediatrix of all graces and co-redemptrix, which the greatest minds in the Church had attested to for centuries before him, including his papal predecessors. All of these things must be taken together in order to understand the bigger picture. But this letter brings us to Archbishop Carlo Maria Vigano, who had released a statement to Dr. Taylor Marshall, and then in, did an interview with John Henry Weston's website, and finally released his own letter and accompanying video on the matter. In that letter, Vigano touches on something I've been mentioning for months now, that Francis is building what Catholic prophecy calls the ape of the church, that false simulacrum or mimic church that looks Catholic but frankly isn't at all. Quote, I think that it has been understood that both civil society and the church suffer from the same affliction that struck the former with the actions in France in 1789, and the latter with the Second Vatican Council. In both cases, Stonecutter thought is that the foundation of the systematic demolition of the institution and its replacement with a simulacrum that maintains its external appearances, hierarchical structure, and coercive force, but with purposes diametrically opposed to those it ought to have." End quote. That, in a nutshell, describes the union of the Church and the Leviathan, that force of the world that seeks to recraft reality and the laws of God into something wicked to serve Satan. But what was Francis's purpose, according to Vigano? 
The purpose is to keep the traditional faith from spreading. The Vatican II project is withering. More and more Catholics are seeking the traditional faith and walking away from parishes with rock and roll masses, with sports banners in the parish, walking away from sermons on the works-based gospel Francis promotes, and instead are seeking out the traditional faith, the faith of our forebears, and that must be squashed in the eyes of the world and its pack papa Quote, if on the one hand we can see how the targeting of dissenters is well organized and planned, on the other hand, we cannot fail to recognize the fragmentation of the opposition. Bergoglio knows well that every movement of dissent must be silenced, above all by creating internal division and isolating priests and the faithful. A fruitful and fraternal collaboration between diocesan clergy, religious, and the Ecclesia Dei Institutes is something he must avert, because it would permit the diffusion of a knowledge of the ancient rite, as well as a precious help in the ministry, but this would mean making the Tridentine Mass a normality in the daily life of the faithful, something that is not tolerable for Francis. For this reason, diocesan clergy are left at the mercy of their ordinaries, while the Ecclesia Dei Institutes are placed under the authority of the Congregation of Religious, as a sad prelude to a destiny that has already been sealed. Let us not forget the fate that befell the flourishing religious orders, guilty of being blessed with numerous vocations, born and nurtured precisely thanks to the hated traditional liturgy and the faithful observance of the rule. This is why certain forms of insistence on the ceremonial aspects of celebrations risk legitimizing the provisions of the commissar and play Bergoglio's game." End quote. There Vigano was talking about what the fate of the FSSP and Institute of Christ the King and other similar groups will inevitably be if Francis's diktat is ordered. They will be controlled until they are deemed not needed anymore, and will be ended the same way the Franciscan Friars of the Immaculate were, as well as numerous religious orders since the beginning of Francis's rule. His plan to end the traditional faith were on full display in his treatment of those orders, and it was done under the auspices of the Congregation for Religious, which now oversee the FSSP and similar groups. Their fate may well be the same as the Franciscan Friars of the Immaculate, if Francis has the time to do it. But there, that's the thing, though. Vigano says the attempt to end the Latin Mass and the traditional faith will not work, that it will backfire spectacularly, which we have already seen in the widespread reports of traditional parish communities of all kinds, ranging from diocesan TLMs to the SSPX, growing dramatically since this order came down. Quote, Another important element for all of us is the necessity of giving visibility to our composed protest and ensuring a form of coordination for public action. With the abolition of Samorum Pontificum, we find ourselves taken back 20 years. This unhappy decision by Bergoglio to end the motu proprio of Pope Benedict is doomed to inexorable failure because it touches the very soul of the Church, of which the Lord himself is pontiff and high priest, and it is not a given that the entire episcopate, as we are seeing in the last few days with relief, will be willing to passively submit to forms of strong-armed rule that certainly do not contribute to bringing peace to souls. The Code of Canon Law guarantees the bishops the possibility of dispensing their faithful from particular or universal laws under certain conditions. Secondly, the people of God have well understood the wicked nature of traditionis custodis and are instinctively led to want to get to know something that arouses such disapproval among the innovators. Let us not be surprised, therefore, if we soon begin to see the faithful coming from ordinary parish life, and even those far from the church finding their way to the churches where the traditional mass is celebrated. It will be our duty, whether as ministers of God or as simple faithful, to show firmness and serene resistance to such misuse of authority. Walking along the way of our own little calvary with a supernatural spirit, while the new high priest and scribes of the people mock us, it will be our humility, the silent offering of injustices towards us, and the example of a life consistent with the creed that we profess that will merit the triumph of the Catholic Mass and the conversion of many souls. And let us remember that since we have received much, much will be demanded of us." End quote. But what do we do? Vigano tells us that we must keep the old faith, that we must reject innovation and practice as our forebears did. Quote, what father among you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent instead? See the Gospel of Luke, chapter 11, verses 11 to 12. Now we can understand the meaning of these words, considering with pain and torment of heart the cynicism of a father who gives us the stones of a soulless liturgy, the serpents of a twisted doctrine, and the scorpions of an adulterated morality, 
and who reaches the point of dividing the flock of the Lord between those who accept the Novus Ordo and those who want to remain faithful to the Mass of our fathers. When our Lord entered Jerusalem seated on a donkey's colt, while the crowd was spreading cloaks as he passed, the Pharisees asked him, Master, rebuke your disciples. The Lord answered them, I say to you that if these are silent, the stones will cry out. See Luke chapter 19, verse 28 to 40. For sixty years the stones of our churches have been crying out, from which the holy sacrifice has been twice prescribed, the marble of the altars, the columns of the basilicas, and the soaring vaults of the cathedrals cry out as well, because those stones, consecrated to the worship of the true God, today are abandoned and deserted, or profaned by abhorrent rites, or transformed into parking lots and supermarkets, precisely as a result of that counsel that we insist on defending. Let us also cry out, who, we who are living stones of the temple of God, let us cry with faith to the Lord, so that he may give a voice to his disciples who today are mute, and so that the intolerable theft for which the administrators of the Lord's vineyard are responsible may be repaired. But in order for that theft to be repaired, it is necessary that we show ourselves to be worthy of the treasures that have been stolen from us. Let us try to do this by our holiness of life, by giving example of the virtues by prayer and the frequent reception of the sacraments. And let us not forget that there are hundreds of good priests who still know the meaning of the sacred unction, by which they have been ordained ministers of Christ and dispensers of the mystery of God. The Lord deigns to descend on our altars, even when they are erected in cellars or attics. End quote. In other words, become saints, and do not let the modernists divide the faithful between those who would go to the traditional liturgy and those who, for whatever reason, choose to remain attending the Novus Ordo. If we embrace their attempts to divide the faithful, we do the work of Francis and of the devil. We must be worthy of having the beautiful treasures of the faith. I began this with a quote from Archbishop Lefebvre, and I'll end it the same way. Quote, At all times, and particularly perhaps in our own age, man wants to eliminate the cross. And he was right, especially in our time. Francis has been using the church to promote a secular program, a partnering of the church with the forces of the world. Not much is obvious, and yet so few are willing to admit it because many have a critical misunderstanding of what the papacy is and what our duties to it are. People believe that the Pope is correct in all things, that he can contradict his predecessors in our time, and that he is correct to do so while his predecessors were simultaneously correct in their time. It's illogical. At the end of the day, the primary job of the papacy is to preserve the faith, not to change it, not to undermine it, not to put it at the service of all the would-be Caesars of the world. And that is what has been the project of the Pope since the Council, but especially and overtly Paca Papa Francis. Archbishop Vigano and Bishop Rob Mutzeritz both state as much. But what will you do? Will you continue to fight the for the deposit of the faith? Especially in these times when things in the world are getting especially weird and last year's restrictions seem to be coming back. Will you submit to the spirit of the world that Francis appears to be serving? Let me know in the comments, please, and like and subscribe if you haven't, and hit that bell. It does help. As always, pray for the church. I'm Anthony Stein. Ave Maria.